<laughs> I love the countdown. So official. So great. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here today. And I hope you were able to join earlier sessions. Um, you are now about to start watching the Equitable Dialogue in AI and Machine Learning. So obviously, this is a very popular topic right now. Um, so we had to have something about AI and machine learning. Um, I'm Brad Dressler. If you are just joining our event, then we uh, I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm the chair of the programming board for the Equity Summit. And I've been involved with Startup for several years on various different boards. And I'm so excited to be moderator for this chat today. Um, and then we have some fabulous experts with us. So I'm going to just ping pong it to them and let them introduce themselves. Oh, I should say my pronouns are he, him. Um, so, and I'm in San Francisco also. So uh, anyone who's just joining us in the chat, feel free to say hi and introduce yourselves and whatnot. And let us know where you're, where you're watching us from. I'll throw it over to Sky and Sky can do a little quick intro and hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Sky King. And for those of you who may be just listening to this broadcast versus seeing it, let you know that I am a white queer woman with bright red hair. And I've got um, sort of a colorful top and I'm sitting amongst some flowers and some um, other, other plants in the background. So um, at least for me, I'm coming at this from a perspective um, of working in the area of behavior science and branding and sort of large corporations. So over the past 20 years, have worked with organizations from early stage startups all the way to Fortune you know, 500 companies on how can they better reach and engage with their audiences and how can they you know, be creating products and campaigns in ways that are actually likely to reach and engage those folks. So excited to bring that perspective here today and we can dive in deeper into any one of those rabbit holes we want but just welcome you all here and again invite you to share sort of where you are i'm sitting in san francisco today so i'm excited for that yeah um, over to nima <laughs> uh hello everyone my name is nima boscarino uh pronouns are he they i'm usually based out in vancouver canada uh today i'm over in london um england uh I worked as a, an ethics engineer at a company called Hugging Face. Um, we, Hugging Face does like open source machine learning uh, ecosystem tools. So people will host their models up there, but we also build tools for people to like build uh, AI projects uh, and do research. Uh, I worked over on the ethics team, uh, implementing tools that let people uh, explore kind of fairness and bias within models, you know, document their data sets and things like that. Um, and just general kind of ethics auditing. Uh, before that, I worked as a machine learning engineer at uh, the Royal Bank of Canada um, within their like AI R&D division. And back before that, uh, my background is just as a software engineer and educator. Um, if I was to position myself in terms of like where I come at from this stuff, I really try to center education and social justice a lot in the work that I do. I'm going back to school for a PhD soon in communications and um, like tech and consent uh, is sort of what I'm focusing on. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, excited to talk about uh, equitable dialogue in AI. It's something I care a lot about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for the intros. And um, I'm just honestly, when I heard your title name, I was like, I'm just glad there are ethics engineers. Like, I feel like, you know, as someone who is not on the the development technical side of things, I come from the marketing world as well. Um, but I, I was just like, oh, I'm just glad there are ethics. Like, I hope, I hope there's ethic engineers like on every team at every company. I mean, I'm, I know realistically there's not, but I wish there were. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you're here to, to represent and um, we can hopefully encourage more and more of that, more job opportunities for you in the future when, if you ever need them. But Hugging Face is very, very um, lucky to have you. So um, I wanna throw out to start with um, what, 
you know, so we're talking about equitable dialogue. And the reason for that is, you know, how people can use or misuse rather um, AI and machine learning. Um, so could you each share a couple examples of maybe for the audience, you know, how could AI or machine learning potentially negatively impact um, historically marginalized people or DEIB um, efforts or things like that, um, not be inclusive, et cetera. Could you, could you each maybe just take a stab at that and share a couple examples so people understand why this conversation is important? Sky, I'll throw it to you first, if you don't mind. All right. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that one of the, the specific examples that comes to mind of where sometimes um, AI tools and other things like that, AI and machine learning can amplify some of the, you know, online harassment or hate speech or other things like that is you, you all might remember, what was it, a, a number of years ago, there was that uh, Microsoft released Tay out onto Twitter. And I think it was something like in, in six, 15, 16 hours, you know, the, the sort of input it received, it was so racist and, and sexist and sort of all those other elements. And it happened really quickly. And I know that companies have taken a lot of steps to plan for, rectify that sort of thing from happening again. But I also think of, you know, just in terms of the potential negative impacts, um, reinforcing some of the stereotypes. You know, we've we've heard some of the AI tools, for instance, that look at facial recognition can sometimes make, um, you know, incorrect estimates of, of truthfulness and sort of other things like that. I think there are challenges of the lack of transparency and accountability with some tools. And the other one I think about just from an accessibility standpoint is the technology divide that we have, right? So we're, we're creating a lot of these tools and resources and are they something that everybody has access to, you know, whether it's through, you know, mo mobility challenges through the devices they're using, or even honestly, like access to bra broadband is something that we still face even in, in this country, you know, having access to those tools and resources. So those are a few that come to mind for me. I don't know, Nima. What do you what do yeah. you think? Any of those? You probably no, I saw you nodding with Tay, so you remember that all. Yeah, those shenanigans. It was a bit of a nightmare, and companies don't tend to do online learning anymore at that like scale because it's just like you can't really protect against that kind of poisoning that the internet is going to send in. Um, no, I hundred percent agree, and I I think it's really important that you brought up the uh, you know the the hardware divide and like the the actual like digital divide that exists. A lot of people in the tech world seem to forget that not everyone has the latest like M2, you know, MacBook Pro and whatever. Um, you know, it's it's important to actually test things out on lower power devices. But the ones that I've been thinking a lot about uh, lately are one in terms of uh, a lot of people in the tech world and the AI world are trying to build tools that are, you know, all encompassing and in their effort to be as, quote, as diverse as possible. Um, I think they do end up bucketing a lot of people into uh, like categories or into like buckets that are easily palatable or understandable for tech people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one example could be in terms of say, like if you have models that are supposed to work on like a large range of languages, um, you know, if you don't employ people that actually speak the languages that you're working with, um, you're going to make assumptions about how those languages work. Uh, and we've seen examples of models being released that supposedly support a number of languages. Uh, but when you get like native speakers to actually, you know, test those out, they're like, this doesn't work at all. Um, and part of the issue there is that I think it makes it easier for people to like reproduce content in certain languages, thinking that it's real. And then you're like polluting the available data, which is already, um, you know, quite limited in many cases. But beyond that, I think there's also the way that this stuff is being used. Um, people really rush to use AI tools to like replace work that they don't quite understand. A lot of that is care work. Uh, a lot of that is creative work um, that is done by, you know, by marginalized people for marginalized people, you know, like, um, stuff that a lot of tech people don't really understand by virtue of just not being a very diverse sector. And um, that's harming people. Like you can't just throw AI willy nilly at the education space 
um, thinking that that's just going to fix our education problems, which are like quite a bit more complicated than like we didn't have AI tutors. Um, same with like mental health. You know, the problem isn't just that there aren't enough chatbots to talk to. It's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, and when you throw out these tools for people to like, you know, get access to mental health by talking to an AI system, a lot of the people that are hurt by this stuff are the people who didn't have the money to go see a therapist in the first place, um, which are largely like racialized, you know, um, and, and marginalized communities. Those are things that I don't think a lot of tech people think critically enough about. Uh, and that's where I'm, I know I'm very worried about in the negative sense. Yeah, I love what you were saying, too, about the the language barriers, too, right? So we know, you know, for tool, many of the generative AI tools we have from, from Jet, chat GPT to MidJourney to others, the data sets they're looking at are from English language, Western based. And, you know, I think a lot about that opportunity for co-creation. So you're right. You can't just take something in, in one language and just translate it, right? Because you lose the cultural competency. So unless you have people who represent those, those identities or those perspectives helping to create the tools or helping to, at the very least, sort of user test and provide feedback on those ahead of time, you're, you're, you're increasing the risk for harm or it, increasing yeah. the risk that you're going to not, not see some of the key things you need to be incorporating. Exactly. And that's like obvious when you're dealing with like multiple languages. A lot of people don't even like say zoom in on just one language and realize that like language is not a strictly defined thing. And by say like defining like English, like standard English, you know, there's like an implicit kind of harm where like you know, we're disqualifying other versions of English from being, you know, what get codified. Um, and so anything like African American vernacular English or uh, other kinds of like pidgin English and, you know, like get left out of the picture. I get worried about the downstream effects of like homogenizing languages this way where you like flatten stuff. You know, I don't see anything wrong per se with like you know, tools that help people write stuff like Grammarly or whatever, right? Like I know people use AI generated tools to help them like write emails and things like that. But it does worry me a little bit that it does kind of send us all into the same stream of like, what does it mean to be professional? You know, like Grammarly has a little icon that you're like, oh, I want to be professional. And it like has you write that way. Right? But I want to be able to step back and go, like, well, what does that like actually mean? though, right? Um you know so it's it's those kinds of things which even within a, one language um you're like invisibly kind of cutting off all these complexities and nuances well and i think it's important for everyone to remember these are tools first and foremost mm -hmm. and they're tools created by humans <laughs> and one thing that always has always stuck with me my entire life and career has been i remember way back in college in my like media law and ethics class like professor saying like look every human has biases it's not and it's not even necessarily that every bias is uh, negative or harmful but you just need to acknowledge and realize that every you and every human being has biases everything from your word choice and you know like your how you were raised all these things if you're like lower income middle income higher income like your perspective on life and things and your biases exist period full stop and so recognizing that when humans are creating anything but especially something that's going to evolve like language or influencing decision making there's going to be substantial human biases sort of built into that tool so i think we be cognizant, very aware of that and just sort of, you know, realize how we can avoid and work around some of those things and hopefully make, you know, the best tools, developing the best tools, but also those that are utilizing tools, mm -hmm. utilizing them from that mindset. So the thinking with biases, biases in mind, so you can avoid those as much as possible. Um, you know, again, we're all humans, we're not robots, but as much as you possibly can realize they exist and avoid those biases when you can. So 
to to that that brings me to a question that i think sky had thrown up to the group and i wanted to ask both of you are what are some of the like specific psychological and cognitive biases that you think can influence ai and ml tools in both you know maybe thinking about it from their development of the tools and also when people are using them like how they're using them like you have any thoughts on that yeah, well, we were just talking a little bit um, earlier about availability bias, right? So what data are we are we using to pull in? And are we, you know, opening our aperture enough to to bring in other sources, whether it's other languages, other perspectives, you know, another bias that we can have a tendency to, to see in AI and machine learning is is groupthink, right? So, you know, are we um you know, thinking about the different ways in which we, we even as a group creating these tools or using them, you know, you're right, Brad, what are the biases we have? And then another one that came up in a session earlier today uh, that I think a lot about is loss aversion bias. So, so sometimes when companies are going down the pathway of creating these tools or getting user feedback, there are decisions made along the way. And sometimes there's a point of no return where, where people aren't willing to put in the, the investment to right size or improve that tool. So I think, you know, there's a couple of examples of that where things were pushed out really early and then they kind of realized after the fact that there were, there were issues with what they were doing because there just was this tendency to avoid, you know, that loss of, of things. So those are some of the big ones that come to mind. I also feel like I have to mention confirmation bias, right? So even when we're using these tools, we're going to seek out the, the things that already support beliefs we hold. So what are the ways that we could maybe engineer um, AI and machine learning tools in ways that, that, again, expose you or open that aperture to other perspectives that could, could inform what you're doing? Yeah, no, I, I agree with all of that. I wanted to throw two other kind of wacky one, one, ones in there too, if there's, if there's space for it. Like one, and I don't know what this bias would be called. I'm sure there's a name, but like the idea that even when uh, tech builders consider bias and consider, you know, building stuff with like marginalized peoples in mind, um, following sort of like, these standard patterns that aren't actually proven, um, but like become ideas of like, oh no, no, like this is how we do things to make them fair or whatever, um, without digging more deeply. Uh, that's one that, you know, we tend to see a little bit. Um, and on the other hand, the, like a bias on the consumer side is, and I think that tech companies are at fault for this, but consumers are sold the idea that these tools are by necessity like useful. Um, and I think that frames stuff in a way where like consumers put themselves in the shoes of like finding salute, like finding ways to use this tech. And that if it's not quite useful for them, then it's like they're not good enough uh, or they're using the tool wrong. Um, so like biased towards thinking that the tech people must be right because they worked so hard on this thing. Um, yeah. So that's, that's something I've been thinking about a little bit, which is. Those, yeah, are, like those are good ones, Nima. There is, I'll, I'll put this in the resources at the end, but there is a cognitive bias codex that you can just Google that. And on a uh, Wikipedia, it's actually an interactive interface and there's 188 plus types of different biases that, that one could potentially do. And, Honestly, when you look across that, there are a lot of ones that AI and machine learning not only can exacerbate, but also could potentially solve for, right? So if we're thinking about some of the decision-making biases and other things like that, maybe there are ways that we're engineering and creating these tools that can offset or can address some of those inherent biases we have. So mm -hmm. I, I, I see the pros and the cons, or there's, there's opportunity across it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I should look back at those cognitive biases because they were fun to dig through. I'll say that in terms of like where AI fits in for like solving mm -hmm. those things, I, I definitely am a little bit on the spe skeptical side because like, I don't know if I've been entirely sold on like AI solving particular like human issues as mm -hmm. much as making certain things just happen faster. 
Um, and that's sometimes a good thing and sometimes a bad thing, but like, um, yeah. Yeah. It's a good point, Nima, right? Because it, it depends on how they're created, right. And what goes in. I remember from grad school, you know, some biostats professor was, you know, crap data in crap data out. Right. So if, what is the influence that has? And, you know, I was at a AI and art event a couple of weeks ago where they were talking about this movement in the future toward, you know, having, having smaller groups or sort of smaller instances where you can curate the data. And it's something that Ogilvy and WPP, our parent company, thinks about as well. Sort of what are the ways we can put protections and privacy and security around certain instances of something like ChatGPT4? or Midjourney or Dolly or some of these other tools, you know, that we use in the creative space and create instances of them where we can curate the data and be thoughtful about pulling in other languages, pulling in other perspectives, pulling in, you know, those, those elements that make it more equitable and more accessible and, and more thoughtful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of huge in terms of making things more equitable is like, letting groups of people decide what they want to be a part of and how they want to craft the tools that they're working with in the first place. I think a huge part of that is making, since these things just like, they're not light to run. Um, I hope that we're heading towards a future where like ha either having the hardware or just somehow having the ability to like run that stuff at a community level is like feasible. Um, especially cause like you do need massive amounts of data to train these things. Um, and so, like, I don't know, the direction that we're headed in right now makes me a little nervous. But I, I got to say, I'm kind of excited to see, like, lawsuits and stuff happening. <laughs> because, <laughs> like, I would love for a little bit of, like, common law and a little bit of, like, you know, re regulatory guidance to pop up around this stuff. Um, that That's actually a really good point. So, related to regulation, I mean, you know, there was... <laughs> There were, there were a few letters posted on the internet people may have read or heard about, about saying like, oh, we should just stop all this until we better understand it because it's dangerous, which, you know, a lot of people are saying PR stunt, et cetera. But I do think it brings up a really good point to be like, like, should these, should these be regulated? How should these be regulated, et cetera? Do you all have any thoughts on like, how, like what's like, since we're kind of starting from a blank slate, like if we could say this is maybe, what would each of you say like maybe is a good idea or best practice how we can start to lay the foundation for some sort of regulation, just having best practices that everyone in this field should follow, et cetera, et cetera. Like where do you think that needs to start and how should it develop? Thoughts on that? Nima, I'll throw it to you since you just sort of mentioned regulation and you're on that thought. Do you have any ideas? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's, I mean, it's pretty complicated. Like, I don't know, there isn't like a couple like easy solutions, but a couple of the, I think are probably worth starting with are maybe number one, the fact that like a lot of these companies got away with paying like next to no taxes for a very long time. And then like, we wouldn't really be having any of these conversations if it wasn't for that. Like I'm personally just not okay with the fact that like Amazon and your, you know, your metas and your Googles got away with paying very little in terms of taxes. And then they got to use that revenue to train giant models off of data that they like scraped and, you know, without really any consent. Like that's just, it's, so it's like, it almost kind of feels like when a cat drags a dead rat into your house and you're like having a conversation about like, you know, I, I don't know, like, what should we do with yeah. the rat? But it's like, the cat's going to keep dragging rats in. Like, I, I don't know, there's going to be like more issues. And I don't want to just like play the like whack-a-mole game. Um, I would start with like, these companies probably need to respect the like, rules that are already set in place in terms of just like labor. You know, it's like really weird to me that these companies are training models and labeling data off of like, very 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 cheap and exploited labor um i almost don't even want to talk about the generative ai stuff because it's like it's almost burying the lead that it's like built on top of like ghost work um you know like i don't know that stuff feels a bit more egregious to me 
than like what is generative AI going to do and what can we use it for? Um, like I think the people who wrote that letter or those letters, I think they're really missing the mark because like I haven't been convinced that generative AI is going to like actually have that kind of impact on our economy in terms of like art, in terms of like creative work. Um, I don't know. I wrote a little article a while ago, like just a little post about like when we read a book, like you read it because you're like in a dialogue with the person who wrote it. Mm -hmm. If I read something that's written by an AI and I know it, then I can't have that dialogue because I don't, the, there isn't an answer to the question, why are the things blue or whatever, right? Like that's not, it, it kind of takes out the whole point of the media. Mm -hmm. And so like, I haven't been convinced that like AI art and AI like text actually solve any of the stuff that we ever look to do with art and text. Um, so, yeah, there's like no it, real motivation behind it. The motivation is because somebody typed in create this. Yeah. Whereas if you're talking with an artist or a, a writer or any sort of creator, like they were, their life experiences and perhaps something very specific motivated them to create that that piece or those pieces. Mm -hmm. So I think, it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's true. When you take out the human element, it's it's not the same thing. Well, so, I, don't, I don't think that's where the industry is going to go. I mean, certainly I don't think so either. creative agency like Ogilvy, it, that would be viewed more as a tool, right? Like, you know, humans are central to that experience and, and thinking about that, right? And, you know, if I, I'm also thinking about the broader sort of applications of AI machine learning to other industries, right? So in the healthcare industry or in, you know, beyond just kind of the, I can use it to help plan my Halloween party. You know, there are, are really amazing sort of new technologies and things. And, and I say new, but, you know, if you go and do a PubMed search on artificial intelligence and machine learning, it goes all the way back to the 50s, right? Now, granted, you know, most of the 200,000 plus articles are, are later, you know, close to where we are now. But, you know, I think that intersection of technology with the human element is really where the power of these tools resides. And, you know, thinking about, you know, this nervousness, I actually think it's great. And in behavior science, we call it sort of present bias, right? So, you know, if something feels like it's really current and now, we'll pay more attention to it and we'll actually do the things that need to be done because there are some real problems um, and opportunities to, to both solve for and harness as a part of this, right? So we know we need um, ethical guidelines and standards that are adopted and that we're using. And there are a lot of different groups that are focusing on, on that. We can maybe chat about some of them. You know, we, we know that having elements of continuous monitoring and feedback and getting that input from those who are, are using these tools and resources is important to have that sort of continual learning environment where we, you know, improve and make sure, you know, especially from a DEI and, you know, belonging standpoint that we're, we're hitting the mark, you know, and, and I talk a lot about the role that interdisciplinary teams play, right? So, you know, I attended a, a session in, in San Francisco before the pandemic that was talking about the programmers, you know, that we have this homogeneous group of people that, you know, at the time somewhat homogeneous, you know, designing and developing these tools and when we diversify our, our workforces and our teams and think about different identities and perspectives and that even at the early stages, we develop and think about these tools differently. And the result is, is different. And, you know, it remains to be seen whether whether it's better and more representative and has the impact we're looking for. But I think it's it's on the right track. So I'm happy that people are nervous and are asking these these important questions i think the key uh, takeaway from something combining the what both of you said and even what sky just said i think there's a couple few things to consider one that you know you said oh i think of it as tools and ogilvy thinks of it as tools and whatnot um so which is great and i agree with that but i think the people that are on the more I'm going to say responsible side of the discussion are going to have that mindset. They're going to have the, Oh, we need ethical guidelines developed. Oh, we need to do this. It's the people on the other side that are wanting to just like the shortcuts and the quick solutions. But I think what is key is 
um, like when you brought up, uh, um, you know, you know, ethical standards and things like that. I think what needs to happen is all of us that are the, I'm going to say immodestly more responsible right now in the discussions that are happening need to be um, more unified. We need to be more vocal and we need to help make sure that there are some standards that are developed sooner rather than later. And then, really push those and encourage those. I mean, there are some examples, obviously not in yet, like cohesively, at least in this space, but you can look at things like there are definitely standard practices that, you know, web three standard practices, um, you know, dealing with accessibility, there are standards and practices that when a large majority of the community gets behind those, the others are, whether they want to or not, are kind of forced to follow because they're held and they're penalized if they don't in some ways. You know, like accessibility is a good example because mm -hmm. they can get pinged on like, you can you can lose your 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 SEO, you know, ranking and things like that if you're not following the standards. So I think, you know, we need to think about not only how the ethics and guidelines are, sta are standardized, but then how... Is that applied? How do we encourage all these companies to do so? And then if they're not following those guidelines, should they be penalized from like a public point of view or, or an easy to find or a ranking or something like that? So, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just curious your thoughts. I know also, Sky, you also mentioned there are some uh, sources out there related to development and organizations that are working on development of such uh, standards and practices. I would love to, for you to share those if you don't mind too. Yeah, I can share those. The The one thing I wanted to, to say is when I look at sort of the boom that's been happening, especially over the last like five years, let, let's say, it reminds me a lot of, of the late 90s or when we had that boom around um, genetics and genomics and cloning and sort of those things were happening. And I, I think that there will always be bad actors you know, there will be those who, you know, circumvent the, the ethics and standards and guidelines and other things like that. But, you know, we've seen that happen in other fields and in other industries. And you're right, whether it's it's regulation or sort of what is the, the brand impact to them? What is the, you know, impact to their ability to get equity? What is the ability, you know, to, to have people work for them? And I think that, you know, that is the the sort of rebel optimist in me that wants to harness you know those those elements for good and then you know there are any of the major you know players from google to intel to you know and i can put these in the chat to mozilla to others are are working on different standards i mean we have them at wpp in terms you know in ogilvy in terms of our standards we're going to use and follow you know on behalf of our clients and i think it's Again, I'm happy people are nervous because it keeps it in the spotlight and it keeps the pressure on for us to actually have change in these areas. And, you know, we didn't used to have HIPAA guidelines, right? So there was a movement and change toward that. So how do we harness the collective energy to, you know, have those things not just be an option, but have them be an integral part of sort of how we do business, how we operate and how we you know, operate, how we, you know, are in the world. Yeah. Nima, do you have any thoughts on that? And then we have some audience questions, but I want to definitely get your thoughts on that as well, as far as like how those standard practices are developed. Yeah, no, there's like, there's a bunch of them. Like Sky mentioned, there's the Mozilla one and, you know, Hugging Faces have been involved and that kind of stuff. And there's, I mean, so many. I was at FACT um, last week, uh, which is a fairness, accountability and transparency workshop run by the like ACM. So, you know, there's so many of these like frameworks. NIST has one for, you know, like risk modeling and whatever. But like, I think something I would love to see is for people to get really radical with it. Um, I get nervous about frameworks being set up because I don't like the idea of tech people just checking boxes and going like, cool, all right, I hit the thing. And these frameworks are being developed by like not a super diverse group of people or like not really in collaboration with large groups of people who like are at risk the most. 
Um, a lot of this stuff feels very paternalistic, I guess, right? Like we're looking out for the small guys or whatever. Um, I would love to see this stuff get really radical. Um, uh, I'll say that so far I haven't, you know, like say there's a lot of stuff about fairness and bias. And like, I used to work at a bank and, you know, you can talk all day about fairness and bias within like the AI context of a bank. But at a certain point, we might have to stop and go like, y'all, like maybe banks are bad. Like maybe putting people in debt is not great. It doesn't really matter how fair I make it and how un. Like, I sit here all day and like cut blades of grass into like little this, this vertical person. But like debt like is awful for communities. It makes people sick. And like, there's no way around that. I think a lot of the stuff that we're aiming AI at being used for falls into that bucket, like recommendation algorithms to like keep people on YouTube and keep people scrolling on TikTok. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter to me how much you get into like, Oh, I don't want to be too left leaning and too right leaning or whatever. Um, you're still capturing somebody's like mind and locking them into something. And to me, that's like an issue of consent and I would just like scrap the whole thing. Right. So I don't know. I haven't seen any of these ethical frameworks go far enough, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I love that. Yeah. Like, let's push it. Cause I think what you're bringing up in terms of, of even agency of people. So like, do I, as an artist have agency over my own content, you know, or can another mm -hmm. group just take it? Like, are there, you know, laws or regulations or things in the future that help that you know yeah. we always say in the behavior science world knowledge alone doesn't equal behavior change right yeah. so often those policy and environmental issues are the ones that are most likely to shift behavior or if you're looking mm -hmm. at you know the incentives sort of mm -hmm. if the if the public sentiment around this would just you know cancel that company maybe they would be less likely to do it you know or if people are no longer willing to invest in companies using responsible, you know, AI and machine learning ethics, well, then there's a disincentive for them to continue operating the same way. So how do we place those incentives in, in areas that they'll actually impact and influence the behavior? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, like, I think, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good point. It needs to be, it needs to be um, enforced or the companies need to be held accountable from both the public perception, I think, as well as like their professional peers. Like, I think, I think that's the only way that's going to work. I mean, that's just my opinion, but I think that if it's one or the other, it won't work it has to be both collectively, you know? And so that's where I think, um, you know, communities need to come together and come to agreement on some, uh, at least a starting point for guidelines. Um, because the longer that it's dragged out, the more harm that is done before they are started to be implemented. It doesn't mean guidelines can't evolve and continue to be added to it. Just need, there needs to be a starting point, right? And and so that's, I hope that comes in the nearest future. Uh, we have some questions that I want to throw to you all because uh, some of these in particular are are really good, especially from our audience, this perspective of the our, who we're working with through start out and everybody who's attending or a lot of people who are attending today. Do you have any thoughts or advice for founders or startups about those that are using or thinking about using some of these AI tools as they build new products or provide services? Um, they have limited resources, so they want to use, you know, something that's going to help them, but how can they be good stewards so that they're at least doing their best um, they possibly can, you know, again, recognizing biases, but what, do any specific thoughts on like either things to avoid or things to keep in mind when using these tools? Yeah. I'd say don't use them needlessly, you know, like I, be really critical about what you're introducing into your stack. You know, yeah. we, we, we built a lot of tech without AI. Do you actually need AI for the thing that you're building? You know, that's something that's probably a good place to start. Like, probably, probably not. Um, if you do, like, do you need to be locked in to a vendor who might change their model at any time or you don't, like, agree with philosophically and politically? You know, if you don't, maybe don't use the thing. Um, but, like, I guess number one is don't be, like, weird. Like, there's a there was just such a long period of, like, oh, gather all the data that you can and we'll see what happens with it. 
I'm like, it's weird. Like, it's just strange to track people. It's strange to force people to do things that they don't want to. Um, I say like build tech with like a really open heart and in like connection to the community that you're working with, like keep people looped into what you're actually doing to them. Um, yeah. So I'm not going to be like, Oh, don't use chat GPT, but like keep in mind that it's trained on data that not everybody was comfortable with sharing, you know, keep in mind that, you know, you're giving money to a company that isn't super thrilled about being regulated um, and is like holding the EU hostage over that or whatever, right? Like, um, yeah, I, I would say to be mindful in that direction. Yeah, I, I like that, Nima, because it, it gets to the heart of, of the human element, right? And what is the critical thinking you can do before you use these, these tools to enhance your work. So, you know, I might say before I'm going to be using a tool like ChatGPT4 or Dolly or Midjourney, I'm gonna think ahead of time about what am I trying to, to achieve here? What is the problem I'm trying to solve? And do that thinking ahead of time because not only will that, you know, kind of still exercise your brain and put that human element in, but it also makes the prompt engineering you're doing much more likely to result in 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 what you're looking for right so we know that there are all kinds of bias and being aware of that can help you know we know that it's important to involve the communities that you're trying to target as a part of that process so not just informing them or educating them but really having you know them part of the entire process so again i i personally don't think I just don't think we're going to be replacing humans. I think that, you know, that that human condition and that strategic thinking has to be a part of it. And the more that we can use these tools with that mindset, the, you know, I would just, it would be awful if somebody just cut and paste or just took something from one of these, you know, tools and just used it right away and, and didn't put in the critical thought to at least review, refine, give it your own personality. What's the storytelling element you want to engage with it? It's just, yeah. So I, I agree with you, Nima, including that human element as a part of the process and baking that in, right? Like we've got courses now on prompt engineering and on bias and there's, you know, discussions around how do we, how do we use these in an ethical and transparent way while essentially having more, I don't know, more of an ability to impact and influence things. Yeah. Um, I would also say, like, just really quick, I'm just going to add to that. Also, be transparent. Like, if you want to be a good steward, be transparent that you're using some AI in what whatever way you're using it. Like, if you're using it for developing marketing materials, if you're using it for developing, like, some aspect of your product, just be transparent about it. Because here's the thing. If you... <laughs> hesitate and you don't want to be transparent about using some sort of a tool or resource then there's probably a reason you're hesitating and that maybe you shouldn't be using that tool or resource so i think you transparency first and foremost i mean and and again i realize that's those those are one to be good stewards um yeah, if you guys want to drop your information in the main chat, um, whether that's your LinkedIn or email or whatever you're comfortable sharing, just so folks can stay in touch. We have about two more minutes left. Um, I know we didn't directly address this question about labor displacement, um, Todd, but I know uh, sort of Sky's point about, uh, you know, we hope or we don't think it's going to like replace humans. It's, you know, the way that at least we're looking at it from this like responsible perspective is it shouldn't be replacing humans. It should be a tool of that kind of thing. Um, Nima thoughts. Yeah. I have, a, I have a small thought there, which is like, yeah. it shouldn't, it doesn't replace the work, but I worry about the people with power using it to replace the work that was traditionally done in a poor way. Right. And like, you know, this isn't the first time that we've seen, you know, say websites get like shut down or completely changed. Um, you know, an easy one to point to that's like recent, like Twitter kind of worked. You know, we had the like verification stuff and that kept a lot of people from being like, um, what do you call it? Like impersonated. 
and we removed it. Um, you know, because some nerd thought that like we didn't need it or here's a better way of doing it or whatever. That's what I'm worried about with the generative AI stuff is people who have the power to fire people and replace their work with generative AI um, and not be held accountable. Um, I, I hope that we find a solution for that. Well, you know, and I, we're starting the dialogue and that's important. Sorry, yeah. go ahead, Sky. I, I was just going to say, we could probably have a whole nother session just on, on that and sort of, you know, will there be displacement of some positions? Absolutely. But there will be creation of other, you know, we're already seeing creation of other types of roles. So, you know, the, we don't want to put our head in the sand on these things. We want to have these open, transparent discussions about what it means for us in society and how can we make sure that everybody um, reaps the benefits of these tools and technologies as we move forward. Yeah, I think that's so true. Um, I think let's keep the conversation going. That's the most important thing, honestly. And then, and then also let's keep holding each other and other organizations and companies responsible. You know, we need to keep using our critical thinking skills and, you know, put that to the test and put these companies, organizations to the test and hold them up to the light and say, Hey, this is not, you know, this is not okay. Um, and I think again, that needs to help come from companies themselves need to be saying those things and individuals need to be saying those things and organizations that set like standards and practices and whatnot need to be saying those things, you know? So I think, but look, we're, the fact that we're having the dialogue today fairly early in the life cycle of the development of these products is, is good. We just need to make sure that action is taken sooner than rather than later and people are visible and vocal about when things are not okay. So, and to be good stewards, again, I'm going to say, be transparent, be transparent. And if you don't want to be transparent, then you're probably not using it in a way you should. So Can I say thanks also for being here expert. today so much. Any quick final thoughts? We are kind of a little over, but uh, if people are still here, we'll, you know, 30 seconds or so over. Do you have any quick thoughts to wrap it up, Sky or I Nima? I was going to say, in addition to being transparent, it's hard to know what to be transparent about if you're not an expert in stuff. So definitely seek out experts in the field. Like, don't be afraid to go find people who will help you figure out what to be transparent about. Um, yeah. and, otherwise it's it's easy to miss big chunks and i'll add on um there are many different ways to classify expertise right lived experience is an important part of that and the perspectives and sort of background and cultural competency is part of that as well even if you know you don't have a bunch of letters after your name as an expert on things or or 20 years of experience it's still valid so yeah taking that whole community approach to how we create and and manage and think about these yeah. Thanks, everyone. There will be a reminder to all the audience. There is a 45 minute break here in programming so that people can hydrate, bio break, get food. This is your lunch time for a lot of people um, or snack time or whatever. So do that. Visit with your pet, your family, whatever. Check your email. Um, but come back and join us later for more discussions, different topics. And then later today, join us in the main room for the closing remarks and We'll have our networking after party where you can network and connect with more folks. Thanks again, Nima and Sky. I appreciate your time today. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.